And we're live. Praise the Lord. Okay, um, how's everyone doing today? Good. All right, praise God. We are excited. Uh, welcome to those of you guys watching uh, online. This is uh, Vision Church Lockhart. I am Pastor Kyle, and I'm the English pastor here, associate pastor. And we are excited to get into tonight's lesson. Uh, we're on the study guide on Discover the Keys to Staying Full of God. And this is really powerful. Uh, you know, I was thinking earlier today about, um, I don't know if I can, probably need to chew on this a little bit more, but let me just share this little piece. God has called us to be a living sacrifice, right? And what God emphasized with me today was the word living, a living sacrifice. A lot of Christians are being a dead sacrifice. They're not being a living sacrifice. And what I mean by dead sacrifice is that you're, we're, you know, a lot of Christians are bound up in religion. You know, doing this and not doing this and always sin conscious and always repenting. Don't even know what they're repenting for. Just always saying, sorry, God, for, you know, what it is I may have done. That, first of all, you can't repent of something that you don't know what you did wrong. Because mm -hmm. repent means to turn from it. You can't turn from something that you don't know right. what you're doing is wrong. <laughs> Amen? And this is, that's just all religion. It's all religion, and it's an attempt to make yourself feel better. When we need to understand the cross and what Jesus did for us, and the power of his blood that, has, uh, that was shed for us, that cleansed us of all sin. Amen. Past, present, and future. And um, so God is calling us to be a living sacrifice for him. Not, not some dead sacrifice. Not some religious person who likes to talk about a lot of different things. And, and talks about faith. And talks about living right. And talks about the Lord. But when you look at their life, they're lacking. There's no power. And that's the difference between a living sacrifice and a dead sacrifice. A dead sacrifice, there's no power but in a living sacrifice, there is power. Amen? How many of you are so thankful that the same power that, that resurrected Jesus Christ up from the dead dwells in you? You have the resurrection life of God inside of you. Amen. And it may be lying dormant in there because you don't understand what you have, but I'm telling you, it's there. And uh, that's why we're here doing these studies on Wednesday night, so we can unleash, unlock the resurrection power of God, the resurrection life of God. Because understanding leads to power in the Christian life. And understanding the principles of God, uncovering the principles of God, uh, will definitely release power, you know, through your life. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, anyway, so discover the keys to staying full of God. What does that have to do with what I just said? Well, being a living sacrifice. Learning how to not just be some religious Christian who talks about it, but being a living sacrifice for the Lord. And being full of God at all times. You know, whether you feel you're close to Him or not, um, knowing that the word says that God is with you and he will not leave you nor forsake you. Amen? Amen. So uh, let's go on to lesson four here. And it's called, What Do You Value? What do you value? So you follow along in your outlines there. Um, in Romans eleven thirteen. well, first of all, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this evening. We thank you that you are alive and well. And because you are alive and well, God, we are alive and well. We thank you, Lord, that our lives are wrapped up in you, God. We thank you that apart from you, we don't have life. There is no life outside of you, God. There's only death. There's only need. There's only lack outside of you. And Father God, I pray that we would not attempt to find contentment or find joy in anyone or anything else rather than you, God. Because all us, us searching for truth all these years, Lord... It's all in vain because all these paths are going to lead us to you because you are the only way. You're the only way, God, to fulfill and to contentment. And so we just lay our lives down this evening and we thank you that you are speaking to us because you are alive in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in Romans eleven thirteen, 13, it says, For I speak to Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. This Greek word rendered magnify here is the same one translated glorified in Romans 121. Therefore, magnify and glorify can be used interchangeably. They're the same thing. To glorify God is to magnify Him. Magnify means to make bigger. Very simply put, right? It means to make bigger. Uh, did, did you know that you can make God bigger? Boom. That's like a bomb on religious people's mindsets, you know? Religious people are like, there's Pharisees right now getting so angry. You can't make God bigger. <laughs> Nobody can make God bigger. You can make God bigger 
in your mind, in your life. Technically speaking, you can't affect his actual size and greatness. God is who he is, uh, regardless of what you think. However, as far as your perception and experience of him goes, you can make God bigger or smaller in your life. It all depends on how you think. And I think that's what a lot of Christians miss. And I'm not trying to be negative here, but just to get us on the right path in our thinking pattern, you know, in our thought life. A lot of Christians have the mindset of as, as though, you know, we don't matter. Like what we think and what we do doesn't matter. It's all about God, right? God is sovereign. And if God wants something to happen, it will. And if he doesn't want something to happen, it won't. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. God acts based on us. God acts based on are, are we in faith or are we in doubt? The Bible says in James chapter 1 that uh, he who lacks faith or he who doubts, he's not going to receive anything from the Lord. It's not dependent upon God's ability, God's power. It's dependent upon how are you thinking? I mean, what's in your heart? Do you have faith? Right? And so, uh, and just like God didn't destroy Nineveh because Nineveh what? They repented. They turned. They heard the word. They, 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 they put faith in the message that Jonah gave them. They repented of their sins. And God did not destroy them because of that. Amen? So God acts according to the way that we uh, conduct our lives. So when you look through the small end of a set of binoculars, everything becomes bigger. But if you turn it around and look through the big end, everything would become smaller. And although it's the same binoculars, your view enlarges or shrinks according to how you use it. So what is your perception on life? Right? Uh, Sister Jill and I were, and, and Brother Leon too, we were talking about this just before service about different prices, you know, when it comes to luggage for flights or gas prices and stuff. And, you know, I understand as a, as a Christian, um, when you see greediness in the world, you know, it can be a little bit disheartening. And because and, it's at your expense. <laughs> Their greediness is at your expense. And, you know, I understand that it's, it's okay to question things, but if, as a Christian, if you're always focusing on lack and need and how this price is too high and that price is too high. It's a poverty mentality and God is calling us to come out of that and to instead have a prosperity mentality that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God knew how, you know, beforehand, uh, since the beginning of the ages, God knew exactly where the gas prices would be today compared to 1960. God has everything figured out. He, had, he knew about all the inflation and about all of that and all the taxes. And I'll tell you that God will provide for you if you will trust in Him and believe Him. But it's hard to trust in God and believe God when you're always focusing on the problem, when you're always complaining about what is wrong, right? I'm not saying as Christians to just pretend like everything is perfect in the world, because it's not. This world is messed up. People are messed up. But in the midst of that, let's choose to put our eyes on God and believe His promises. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So our minds are like a pair of binoculars. Depending on the choices we make and the things that we focus on, we can either magnify God and diminish our problems, or vice versa. The sad truth is that most of us have become masters at making the smallest, most insignificant things bigger, minimizing God and His Word. Uh, it, it's almost like we're a spiritual child, right? Your child cries over things that are not significant at all, like a popped balloon, or they drop their ice cream, or just whatever it is. I mean, they cry over the smallest little things. And sometimes it annoys you <laughs> as a parent because you're like, what is wrong with you? It's not a big deal. <laughs> you know? But to them it is. And it's about all how you see it. And, then, and you know, if you're an um, immature Christian, you're going to be the same way. You're going to fall apart at the most insignificant things, at things really that aren't that big of a deal. And so it's not that your problems don't matter, but rather it's about having the um, – Maturity uh, maturity is directly connected with perception, okay? Maturity is directly connected with how do you see things, amen? And that directly affects how you're able to deal with things and handle things and how much you're able to handle and deal with. And uh, so God's calling us to grow up by the milk of the word, and that's the only way to grow, by the milk of the word. You're not going to grow by listening to Caleb. It might encourage you, but you're not going to grow by Caleb, amen? amen. Uh, you're going to grow by the word. Praise the Lord. That's right. So that's the only way to grow. Uh, in our negativity, we focus on and magnify the tiny little toothpick that the devil puts in our path. By the time we're finished thinking about what could happen, it's become a huge baseball bat that Satan uses to beat our brains out with. But we are the ones who magnified it and made it so big. In other words, 
sometimes we give Satan too much credit because, you know, you have the power to either empower Satan or make him flee. Because the Bible says in James, when you submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Not maybe, not probably, you know, he will flee when you resist him and submit to God. But you also have the power to empower him. Amen? Because Satan's going to throw thoughts at you. Satan's like, here's a thought. Bam. And, and Satan knows. He's like, yep, they're going to meditate on that thing all day long. About how their family member did them wrong, or this person did them wrong, or whatever the case is. They're worried about this bill, or worried about Satan's just going to get you to meditate on the wrong thing all day long. Just, just one little pop, a little you know, question in your head, and boom, got you on this tangent all day long. And as a Christian, you know, we have to control our thoughts. We have to choose. Okay, are we gonna? There are problems in life, but how are you going to respond to those problems? Amen. Are you going to worry? Which the Bible says is not going to add one cubit to your stature. Or are you going to trust God? Are you going to believe God? Are you going to release faith through your words? Sometimes you got to give yourself a pet talk. And you got to talk yourself into faith. That's true. You know? I, I talk out loud. When there's a negative thought in my mind, I said, in Jesus' name, I rebuke that. I talk out loud. And I don't like say for everybody to hear me. In Jesus' name, I rebuke that. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I mutter it under my breath. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not going that path. You know, so and what what that's doing is you're guarding your heart. You're guarding your heart because faith is of the heart. Faith is how we receive from God. And if you want to if you want to receive from God, you've got to guard your heart. You've got to. And the way to guard your heart is you've got to filter your thoughts. Amen. And stop allowing all this junk to to clutter up your heart. And then you wonder, why is God not coming through for me? Why is why am I not receiving anything from God? Because you've allowed bad thoughts you meditated on them, and they've gotten in your heart, and now your heart is full of doubt and unbelief. And it's not about God not wanting to do anything for you. It's about your inability to receive because you're magnifying the wrong things in life. Yeah. God loves you. God's given you his word and his spirit. Yeah. But you've got to do the rest. You've got to meditate. You've got to get revelation. You've got to grow by the, by the milk of the word. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. One of our Bible college students wanted to see me. He came into my office and began to cry. Since something always seemed to bother him, I asked, what's wrong now? And it was a Monday, and he had attended church the day before. He said, I was so hungry to hear God's word, but the two women who were sitting in front of me talked and laughed throughout the entire service. They distracted me. And then he broke down weeping about how the devil had used this to steal away the word. And I had just gotten off the phone with a friend of mine. He would just lost his wife for nearly 50 years. And I called to minister to him, but he was glorifying and magnifying the Lord, saying, God is so great. God is so good. I love him so much. His mate of almost half a century had just died, yet he was praising and thanking God. Amen. Yet here was this other guy sitting in my office crying because he missed hearing a message. Amen. Sometimes, when, you know, when you get some perspective in life, then you're like, hmm, maybe it's not, maybe it's not so bad. Right? Uh, two women... Talked and he was ready to give up. That's just stupid. <laughs> Why didn't he just get up and move or ask them to be quiet? This wasn't a big deal until he magnified it. And you know, sometimes I think people who complain about the problems the most, I honestly think they like it. They secretly relish in it. They're looking for a problem to complain about. Honestly. You know, and I'm not saying that's everybody, but let me say it. There are people who complain about this problem and that problem, and they pretend... Like they want things to be better, but they don't. They like complaining. They like being negative. <laughs> Amen? I mean, that's just the truth. But you free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's bothering you today? A year from now, you probably won't even remember it. Even if the Lord doesn't intervene and fix the situation you're so upset about, in 12 months, you'll forget it. Why? Because it's insignificant. It's, it's not really a problem. You're just magnifying it. When people come up to me in prayer lines and tell me their problem... Sometimes I literally have to bite my lip to keep from laughing. I want to say, this is it? This is the big problem that's derailed you? I've had worse things happen on my good days. <laughs> Honestly, some of the things people get so upset over are nothing. I'd like to buy them a one-way ticket to some third-world country. I've been to where uh, they can see firsthand what true hardship and suffering is really like. Mm -hmm. And Lord help me. Amen. 
all these people in the United States of America complaining about, oh, this, you know, I, I, these people don't make enough money and they, they don't have it well off enough. I guarantee you 75% of those households have an Xbox One or whatever the newest Xbox yeah. is. And they have a 75 inch TV. Yeah. I'm telling you, Unfortunately, and, a, and a, or a PS4, whatever it is, you know, we really don't have it that hard. Can things be better? Yes, they can. But things aren't going to get better if you're just complaining all the time. Right. Amen? All right. Uh, <laughs> they, they return with a whole new perspective, he says, and they magnify things very differently. Very differently. Um, <laughs> it's just like, you know, people, and, you know, you can hate Trump, uh, love Doc, President Donald Trump, whatever, whatever you're, you have, that's up to you. Right, that's between you and the Lord. But I just thought it was so funny that uh, people were saying, if Donald Trump gets elected, uh, we're going to move to the, Canada. We're going to move to this country, and they're still here. You know why? Because it's still a great country. Yes, Amen. Things can be better, of course, but I'll tell you, this, this country is blessed. Yes. Amen. Yes. And we've got to keep magnifying the Lord if we want to stay blessed. Amen. Because we saw what happened to Israel when they went off the rails and they started serving other gods and not magnifying God that they should, you know, and being thankful to the Lord. And uh, we saw how that turned out. They, they were dispersed. They, they came to nothing. Yeah. Amen. And the same thing will happen to us if we don't keep magnifying the Lord. So it's not anything to worry about. Some people worry way too much about this country, about things they can't control. And you know what? Just live your life, raise your family, and vote according to, to biblical values. That's the way that you can make a change. Stop, stop worrying about all this stuff that you can't. The, the media wants to just get you hyped up with your feelings and your emotions. Amen. And if you focus on what they're saying, you're just going to be you know, depressed or angry all the time. <laughs> yeah. And just focus on the word. Focus on the goodness of God. And, and if you can do something great, you know, raise your family up and, and stand up for the, the values in the Bible. But uh, if you can't do anything about it, just don't worry about it. Amen? Amen. Uh, we talk about how kids have it so hard today. They whine if they don't have the newest electronic device. And life isn't difficult on children today. Amen? Those of us who are older, I'm, I mean, I'm not older, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm only 28. But those of you who are older can testify to that, right? Yes, amen. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the easiest generation that has ever been. Uh, he says here, Thomas A. Crapper. What a, what a horrible <laughs> last name. <laughs> I feel sorry for that guy. Let's make fun of him in school. Anyways, uh, Thomas A. Crapper was born in England in 1836. When he was 11 years old, his parents gave him a sack with some, with some clothes and one day's food supply in it. They told him they loved him, patted him on the back, and sent him on his way. He walked 165 miles to London. He had no relatives or anyone else to look out for him. He was on his own, live or die, sink or swim. He didn't have a government-sponsored social system like we have today. He couldn't exist on welfare. He could have died. Thomas was on his own at 11 years of age. And that's really how life used to be, right? If you couldn't take care of yourself or you didn't have family to take care of you, you're done. You're, I mean, yeah. you're done. There, there's, you know, there, there's nothing for you, right? And uh, so... Much, much easier today. I couldn't imagine one of my kids being out on their own and trying to make their way in life at 11 years old. This had to be unusual. The next paragraph said this was very unusual. Most kids didn't leave home until they were 12. If you were a typical 12-year-old in England in the 1840s, you were on your own to make your way in life as an adult, live or die, sink or swim, and now that is pressure. Amen? You know, and I will say that, obviously, I don't know, things were cheaper back then, but he also made a lot less back then as well. You know, so I think it kind of evened out, but, um, you know, in today's world that we live in, I mean, at least in the United States, you know, it's, you, you, gotta, you gotta be making some money <laughs> to move out on your own because there's this bill and that bill, and, you know, I mean, it's, so, it's almost a necessity today that you have a phone, a smartphone, because everything is done through technology today in the world that we live in, the world that we operate in. But, Anyways, not having designer jeans, the newest video game, or being able to watch MTV is not pressure. <laughs> not being able to drive a car, stay out past 11, or do everything your friends do isn't pressure. And I think sometimes when you enjoy prosperity for so long, you can take it for granted. If, if you don't, let me just say this, if, if you don't continue with a heart of thankfulness, 
uh, you will eventually take things for granted. That's right. Amen. You have to live a life of thanksgiving if you want to continue to be content in your current situation and, and enjoy the prosperity. Because it can get to the point to where you're not enjoying the prosperity anymore because you're just magnifying every little bad thing. <clears throat> you know? So uh, we've got to be careful about that. And this, this whole thing about the designer jeans and this video game, you know, when I was, when I was in high school, um, one, of, one of the blessings I had in my life was my mom teaching me about stewarding my finances, right? You know, set this money aside for this, here's some, here's some you know, have fun money, and then save the rest. And going through high school, I wasn't the cool kid. I didn't have the newest Nikes. I mean, I wasn't in rags, but you know, I didn't have the newest Nikes. I didn't have like the, the greatest, you know, clothes out there and stuff. But I'll tell you what I did have, when it came time for me to drive a car, I had a car. You know why? Because I had saved up enough money to buy a car. Praise the Lord. And, um, and you know, I just attribute that to, to the Lord, obviously, and my mom uh, instilling those values in me. And we need to be passing that on to our kids. That's why there's so many kids today, they don't, they don't know anything about how to steward finances. Because the parents aren't teaching them. Because some of the parents don't even know themselves. Amen. And it's sad. And we need to turn this thing around and start learning, according to God's word, how to steward finances. Amen. So, um, anyways, that, you know that's that's the smart thing to do, and things that we need to we need to pass on. Praise the Lord. The reason we consider that pressure is because we have magnified it. We've said that peer acceptance is so important that kids need to feel good about themselves and have positive self esteem. One hundred and fifty years ago, people were just trying to survive and live another day. They didn't have time to think about their self esteem. That's true. They were working too much. To think about, man, I'm so ugly, you know, <laughs> I mean, or nobody likes me, or I don't have any friends, like, they were working too hard, you know, seriously, I'm just saying, I mean, kids tell them that these days, you know, I'm just, they look in the mirror and say, you know, nobody likes me, or I'm, I'm ugly, isn't there somebody out there who thinks you're hot, I mean, somebody does, there's somebody for everyone, so, and, and, you know, the Lord created you, so uh, he, he didn't create anything ugly, he, he created you, you know, unique. Praise the Lord, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. So, <laughs> they didn't have time to think about their self-esteem. The reason so many people are so messed up emotionally today is because we have misplaced values. But we live in a, this is here, but we live in a high-stress society. Nobody has lived under the pressure that we have today. Have you ever been a soldier in a combat zone? That's pressure. Right? Mm -hmm. I never have, but I can imagine. If you make the wrong move, you're dead. I mean, that's some pressure. Or the person next to you would be dead. Wives and children during World War II had to see their husbands and fathers go off to war and never come back. Imagine how heartbreaking that would be. You know? I mean, there was a good chance that if you went off to war, you weren't coming back. <clears throat> that's pressure. Sitting in a traffic jam is only pressure because you make it pressure. Praise the Lord. Put on some teaching. Put on, put on a podcast. Use technology to your advantage. Uh, it's because of the way that you think. You needed five minutes to get from A to B, but you only gave yourself three. I'm, I'm so guilty of this. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I really am, you know. I, I will, uh, what, do, what do you call it? I totally blanked on the word. Procrastinate. Yes, unfortunately. <clears throat> have mercy on me in that area. <laughs> but <laughs> it's true, though. Um, I, you know, I used to, when I would drive, I used to, this is, this is when I was in Colorado, and I used to, like, ride people's butts, and just, you know, I was that person. I was yeah. that guy. And I have since matured <laughs> to where I stay two car lengths behind people. And, you know, I don't, even if they're going slow, I will not ride them. <laughs> I'll just go around or something. Because I just, I just learned it's not worth it. Yeah. Give myself a heart attack. You know, I'm trying to speed up somebody in front of you. And it's just not worth it. It's rude, first of all, as well. It's rude. And uh, so, praise the Lord. I've since grown a little bit since then. But uh, you, you've put pressure. Let's see. Make sure, right? This isn't, you put pressure on yourself and magnify these things. This isn't a high-pressure society. It is the most privileged, luxurious, easy generation that has ever lived on the face of the earth. If you're feeling pressure, worn out, and burned out, it's because you have misplaced values. It's, it's, listen, the problem is not the world around you. 
Because let me tell you, the world around you is not going to change. The problem is right here. And that's great because you can change that. You can control that. If your problem is out there, you can't control that. Amen? Amen. So we've got to stop playing the blame game and, um, and you know, ask the Lord to figure out, God, where do I need to change? What am I doing wrong? Because I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be stressed out all the time. I don't want to, you know, be angry all the time. I, you know, with myself, and this was, this is a few months back. Um, I really had to make a life change in my life because I was, <coughs> I was feeling uh, just anxious all the time. And it was because I was paying too much attention to uh, the, the news and political things, you know, that were going on. And I was just, you know, always, always my emotions were, were up and down because I was paying attention too much to what other people were saying. And it was, it was unhealthy for me and I felt it. And, and I've never ever in my life um, felt the pressure of a panic attack, but there's one night where I actually felt like, 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 like the enemy was attacking me and I was like, all these thoughts were coming to my mind like, oh my gosh, you're gonna have a heart attack and all this stuff. Like, I'm telling you, the enemy was working double time on me, overtime on me. And, um, and I had to make a life change. Like, this is not worth it. I'm just not gonna listen to certain things. I'm not gonna listen to certain people. Because it, it was just causing too much. And so, uh, mainly the biggest life change was distancing myself from social media. Yeah. That, that was the biggest life change. Yeah, I mean, I still use it, of course, but I mainly use it for football stuff. <laughs> I don't care about politics. I don't even know, like, there, I know the impeachment trial is going on. I have no idea what is going on in it. I haven't, I haven't listened to anything. I have no idea. Everybody, the whole country is so concerned about I understand, I mean, we should be concerned about our country and about the president and stuff, but I just, I don't care. It's out of my hands, you know? I can't control whether he's impeached or not impeached. People are just so up in arms about everything. And it's like, you can't change anything. When it's time to vote, vote. You know, other than that, just, you know, arguing with people, fighting with people. On, I used to do that on Facebook. It's pointless. Nobody's changing their mind. Right. Nobody's changing their mind about anything, you know? So take that as, as, as you will and, and make some life changes if you need some more peace and joy in your life. But, you know, pray to the Lord about that. But um, he says, hey, you're pressuring yourself. It's not our society. You chose to get on the treadmill. You're the one who magnifies or minimizes everything that comes into your life. You have a choice to say no or to say yes. What do you value? What is big to you? Is your problem bigger to you than God? You can magnify the Lord and make him bigger. The way you do so is by glorifying, praising, and thanking him. Find someone in the word who had a similar situation and overcame it. You know, the Bible says that the Old Testament was written for admonition as an example to us of things to do and things not to do. Meditate on it and make these things more real to you than what your bank account, relatives, friends, or even what your own mind says. You need to get to a place where God's word is true and the Lord is far bigger than the situation. Amen? You can't even trust your own thoughts or your own heart. The word of God is the only thing that you can trust. This has to be your guide in life. This ha you have to allow this to, to, to form your belief system and to form your thought processes. Consider Jehoshaphat going out and fighting the mighty armies that are against him in uh, 2 Chronicles 20. He put the singers out in front praising the Lord, and he defeated the enemy without them even drawing a sword or firing an arrow. Just say, God, that's how big you are. You destroyed hundreds of thousands of enemy troops through singers praising him. You're awesome. That makes God bigger. Then you intentionally disesteem your problems and say, this is of no value. It's of no worth to me. I'm not in the ministry. Uh, it says here to have you like me. I'm doing it because God has placed a call on my life. When he called me, I was an introvert. I was shy, embarrassed, and could hardly talk to anyone. Standing in front of people was the last thing that I wanted to do. And for the first two years, it was terrible. He says there, I struggle with fear and, and all kinds of things. But the Lord has shared some truths with me that have changed both my life and the lives of many others. I minister out of love for God and to help people. However, I don't prefer that you dislike me. And then nobody likes to be unliked, but there's going to be people who aren't going to like you. You know, you can try to do everything within your power and somebody is not going to like you for something. It could be the smallest thing. So you can't worry about pleasing people. Just be you. 
this is this is my thing. I'm gonna be who I am, and if that, you know, if I mean we should be considerate of others. There's a balance to this. You should be considerate of others. But at the same time, you should also be able to be yourself. Amen? That's right. And if people don't like that, take rocks. They're not worth having in your life. You know, you've got to be free. You can't let people hold you captive and manipulate you to what the way they want you to be. You have to be free the way that God created you. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. You need to love yourself <laughs> the way that God loves you. All right. He says, it doesn't bless me when someone comes up after a service and tells me they didn't like the message. But do you know what? It doesn't keep me up at night either. I don't lose one bit of sleep over it. Why? When it comes right down to it, I don't give a rip. <laughs> I minister because I value God so much, and he's leading me to do it, whether anyone likes what I have to say or not. Amen? First of all, that is so rude to go up to a pastor or whoever it is after a sermon and say, that sucked, you know? <laughs> I mean, that, that, is just, that is just so rude. Like, even if you think that, keep it to yourself. <laughs> it's just so rude and... Uh, I mean, it's just like someone coming up to you at your job and, and saying, you're doing a horrible job. <laughs> I mean, anyways, we, we, need to be, we need to be encouraging one another and, uh, and, and loving one another. All right, if you're afraid to witness, he says here, if you're afraid to witness, it's because you value the opinion and acceptance of others more than God's in your life. You don't want to expose yourself to the possibility of someone ridiculing, criticizing, or otherwise rejecting you. You haven't placed a proper value on God. All Satan has to do after the Lord moves in your life is to put you in a situation where you compromise in some way or another. You have all these other things that are so important to you that you have to maintain, so you walk away from the revelation of God, but the Lord never quits transmitting. God's love, joy, peace, healing, anointing, presence, or anything else is there for you the same now as the moment that you experienced him. God loves you the same now as he did then. In fact, he loves you more than you've ever yet perceived, ever. God isn't the variable. You disesteemed God when you started esteeming someone or something else. So whether you feel close to God or far from him, whether you feel like, you know, whether it was a time in your life where you were serving God the strongest or a time in your life where you, maybe you're going a little bit astray, God loved you the same. But you're not going to feel his love the same because you're filling your heart with other things rather than God's love for you. Amen? So, however, you can go back and refresh those things in your life by glorifying God. Say, Father, forgive me for placing such value on other things. Forgive me for letting what other people thought uh, to be more important than what you've said and done. Forgive me for being more interested in the Super Bowl and the World Series than you. And listen, I'm a big fan of football. I love football. I'm a big Raiders fan. So God have mercy on my soul, you know? Um, but, I mean, the Lord comes first. Amen? The Lord comes first, and, and uh, he, he's got no, to be number one in your life than anything else. And Anyways, all right, let's keep going on. Forgive me for magnifying my business, family, and other things above you. I put them ahead of you and forgot you. The way you glorify God is by talking about him. Remember what he's said and done. Be thankful, and as you magnify the Lord, what he's done in your life will be refreshed and restored. I constantly go back and remember the things that God has done in my life. They're actually more real to me now than when they first happened. They're bigger in my life today than they were almost 40 years ago. I've never had to return to my first love because I've never left. Mm. If you have to return to your first love, don't be condemned. Just return to him. But don't ask God for a fresh outpouring of his love. That's like saying, Lord, what you did wasn't good enough. God never quit transmitting. It was you who stopped receiving. Come back to him and say, Father, forgive me for ever walking away from what you said and did in my life. I value, prized, and esteemed other things more highly than you. You can go right back to wherever you left God and start putting the proper worth, value, and esteem on him. You can recover anything that you have lost. The truth is, you've never lost it, right? If you were ever healed... His healing virtue is still in you. It never leaves. God never stopped releasing, but you quit receiving. Amen. Go back and build yourself up in that area. Receive by faith the Lord has already provided by grace. Amen. And 1 Samuel 36, uh, it says, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. 
In the midst of David's darkest moment, he magnified God. His troops spoke of stoning him. All their beloved wives and children were gone, not to mention their possessions. But instead of becoming discouraged and thinking, poor old me, and it's very tempting to think that way, isn't it? Poor old me. It's very tempting to think that way. And you might have good reason to think that way, especially if you've had a string of events happen where uh, just things were coming against you. Amen. Yes, amen. I mean, it's, it's, believe me, it's easy. And, and I don't know why this is, but sometimes it does feel like it's almost like Satan attacks you in spurts. You know what I'm saying? Just like when it rains, it pours. Uh, sometimes it feels like that. And because um, if it was just like, oh, it's just one thing. Yeah, I can handle that. But it's like when there's a spurt of just all this stuff, it's like, what is going on? <laughs> and, and you might even question, like, God, is this you? Am I, am I reaping something from you that I've sown? And, uh, but I'll tell you, God is not one who, who you know, repays evil. And he's not one who, who is out there to, to punish you. He will correct you. But there's a difference between correction and punishment. Because God is not holding your sin against you. And to me, that's punishment. You know? Like, punishment is, okay, you did this, I'm crediting this to you. And you have to make up for it. And th that's different than correction. The blood of Christ has been spilled, and God's not punishing us for our sin. He will correct you, but correcting you is for your benefit. Punishing you is just to hurt you. <laughs> I mean, in, in a sense, you know, for, for what you've done wrong. But correction is, is different because it's for your benefit. It's, it's leading you the right way. So it's easy to think, poor old me. Uh, but in the midst of that, David encouraged himself in the Lord. He began to glorify and magnify God in the midst of a very bad situation. And you can do that too. You can choose to get down, ball and squall, gripe and complain, or you can choose to magnify and glorify God. Because I'm telling you, your flesh is weak, and it's very easy for your flesh to cry. It's, and it's okay to cry. Sometimes if you feel overwhelmed, just cry it out for the Lord. You know, He sees your tears. But there's a difference between crying out of reaching out to God and difference in crying just feeling sorry for yourself. There's a difference there. So he says, I have, he says, I haven't been discouraged and depressed since 1968. But Andrew, you must not have any problems. He says, I have problems just like anybody. In fact, ministers have more problems than others because they have invisible targets on them in a spirit realm. However, I've made some conscious decisions that, that I like being full of joy and peace more than I like being discouraged and depressed. Therefore, I just encourage myself in the Lord. Just like what it, you know, what it says in Romans chapter 8. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be uh, carnally minded is death. So you got to decide what, what mind you're going to be of. Sometimes I have to literally shut out what's going on in my life and force myself to focus on God. I have to turn away from looking at the natural circumstances and choose to magnify and glorify God. At times, I've had to start doing it through gritted teeth. He says, I didn't feel like it. I didn't have a, a rush of positive emotion. But through gritted teeth, I said, God, I glorify you. You are awesome. It wasn't very long before the joy and the peace started flowing. And then, and you know, I remember in my life when I was real young in the Lord, right? I gave my life to the Lord when I was 13. But I was real young in the Lord, spiritually speaking, not, not physically, okay? And uh, I just remember the smallest things would just affect me so much. You know, I would cry and like if I didn't feel God's love and presence all the time, I'd just be like, God, where are you? You know, I was I was so immature. I just didn't understand about walking by faith and, and understand about, you know, your emotions don't tell you the truth all the time. And sometimes even though you don't feel this way, uh, you, you, you know, you still got to, you know, put on your big boy pants, big girl pants and just carry on and, uh, and continue to have faith in the Lord. I didn't understand at the time, but, you know, thank God over time that I've, I've grown from that, and, and uh, life is much better now. Life is not fun when you're always on a roller coaster. Amen? So he says here, Jamie, uh, Jamie that's uh, Pastor uh, Minister Andrew's uh, wife, Jamie and I received a call at 4.15 in the morning on March 4, 2001. It was our oldest son, Joshua, who told us that our youngest son, Peter, was dead. He'd been dead for over four hours. And we had negative emotions just like you would have had. But, like I've been teaching in a study, I refuse to let grief and sorrow occupy a higher place than my praise of God. 
We took authority over the situation, released our faith, and jumped in the car. As Jamie and I drove that hour into town, I just started praising God. I thanked him for his faithfulness and let him know that I would continue serving and loving him with all my heart, regardless of what happened with our son. As I began to magnify God, faith rose up in my heart, and I knew that I knew that Peter would live. When we arrived in the Colorado Springs, he says, I found out that five or ten minutes after we had received the call and prayed, Peter just set up and started talking. He'd been stripped naked and put in a cooler with a toe tag on him, but God raised him from the dead after nearly five hours. Thank you, Jesus. And there was no brain damage, or as Peter himself says, no more brain damage than before. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's funny. All this happened because I refused to let anything else occupy God's rightful place. You're the one who can choose to do these things. You can edify yourself. Amen. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 4.20, Abraham was strong in faith. How was he strong in faith? By giving glory to God. Romans 4.20. Magnify God. Give him glory. Put worth and value on him. Say, Lord, you're bigger than this financial problem, this marriage issue, relationship challenge, health crisis, or job. And all of that's temporary. It's all temporary. God, you're bigger than anything. You are awesome. And when you start magnifying God, your faith just grows. The reason some of us don't operate in more faith is because we haven't spent any time magnifying God and verbally acknowledging that he is bigger than our problems. You need to say things like, God, you are bigger than my problem. You're bigger than these situations that I'm facing. When you magnify and glorify him, your faith rises and anything is possible. The reason why you feel so affected by things is because you're, you're not feeding your faith, you know? I mean, your faith is on low. I mean, it's there, but it's just, it's on low. Your tank is on, on your spiritual tank is on low because you're just, you're not feeding yourself. And so, you know, it's hard, to, it's harder to stir yourself up. And, and some Christians wait for a tragedy to strike before they try to fill up their spiritual tank. And that, you know, that's not good. Amen? Um, you got to be ready for what, you got to be prepped and ready for what's to come. Because you know a trial will come eventually. Are you going to be ready for it? Amen? Mark 9, 23, all things are possible to him that believes. But it is up to you to glorify God. Most of us are not doing this very well today. We magnify our problems, and our society is geared toward magnifying insignificant things. Therefore, we need to put the right value on things. One night, someone broke into a department store and didn't steal anything. However, they did change all the price checks. The next day, a $200 vacuum cleaner sold for $8, and an $8 item sold for $200. That store did business until noon before they figured out what had happened. This caused great havoc. Like, how, do you, how do you not figure that before then? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Especially if you're a worker there. It's like, how oh, sweet. This nice vacuum for $8? Tell you. It's probably the same people who want $15 an hour. <laughs> the fast food restaurant. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. I need to re I should look that. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. I worked in fast food, so I can say that. Praise God. <laughs> All right. That's what Satan has done in our society. He's come in and changed the value on us. We think we need certain things. We put so much attention on physical, material things, but they don't really matter in the light of eternity. When it is all over, God is who will matter most. Your relationship with the Lord is really the only thing that matters in your life. Therefore, you need to place the appropriate value and worth upon it. Do so consistently, and you will stay full of healing, joy, peace, deliverance, anointing, power, whatever you need. You are the one who determines how full you are. God isn't the one who decides. True revival is simply you becoming so full of God that you overflow onto someone else. That is, this isn't up to God, it's up to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's go ahead and stand, and we're going we're gonna to pray this together. And if you're watching online, pray with us. Amen. Let's exercise our faith. We're running short here. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. All right, go ahead and repeat after me. Say, Father, Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love, thank you for your, love. your goodness, your grace. Your grace. Thank, you thank you for always believing in me. Thank you for always believing in me. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. For your healing. Thank you for your mercy in my life, God. 
Put my faith in you, Lord. Put my faith in you, Lord. I choose to magnify you. I choose to magnify you. And I know that magnifying you is not a one-time occurrence. It's not a one-time occurrence. It's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. Father, help me to magnify you every day. And I repent forever disesteeming you. Forever disesteeming you. Forever making you small in my eyes, in my life. Thank you for your forgiveness, God. Thank you for your forgiveness, God. And thank you for setting me on a new course. Thank you for setting me on a new course. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Praise the Lord. Well, let me go ahead and um, say this before I end the, the video. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, feel free to message the church or comment below and we'll get back to you.